All right, so now we are moving into Rudolf Steiner's book of lectures, the fifth gospel uh, from the Akashic Record. This is his idea of reading the Akashic Record where he can get information from the other side and uh, channel it. And these lectures were given on October 1st, 1913, down through February 10th of 1914 uh, in Oslo, Berlin, and Cologne. Um, after his break with the Theosophical Society, uh, the Anthroposophical Society had been formed in 1912. Uh, in December of 1912, it was officially named, and then I think the first uh, meeting was in, held in February of 1913, if I remember rightly. And uh, Annie Besant, who was in charge of the Theosophical Society, especially its eastern, uh, its emphasis in Adyar in India, um, its eastern branch. And uh, the break had happened over a number of issues, um, th there was a lot of political infighting between different factions, um, but the main issue, or one of them anyway, was this idea that Charles Ledbetter had found on the beaches of India, uh, Jiddu Krishnamurti and his brother. Uh, they were teenagers, 15-ish, and Ledbetter had put him forward as the reincarnation of Jesus Christ. And uh, Ledbetter claimed, I think this was in uh, 1910, if I remember, uh, Ledbetter claimed that he could rem uh, that this individual could remember uh, 30 of his past lives, going all the way back to 23,000 BC. Um, and uh, Steiner cast a skeptical eye on Ledbetter's uh, so-called researches into uh, the past lives of in this individual, and he most certainly wasn't going to put forward this idea that Krishnamurti was the reincarnation of Christ, since the Christ event was a one-time only event for Steiner in his uh, mythology, a one-time only event where the Christ being came down from the sun once and once only, and it wasn't something that was ever going to be repeated. And uh, the Order of the Eastern Star had been formed uh, as a means uh, in Europe, uh, in Central Europe, of putting forward uh, Jiddu Krishnamurti, of making ready for him as this great new teacher. Uh, and Steiner had been very, very skeptical. He was very skeptical of Ledbetter, uh, Andy Bassan at one point, uh, I think this was in 1909, had asked uh, Steiner if he, perhaps he could remember a previous incarnation as John the Evangelist, and maybe he would like to play that role, uh, as though this was like a, a, a play or something. And Steiner said uh, politely, no thank you. Uh, Steiner was a very even-tempered individual. Um, he never was an individual who slung shit, uh, unlike Young, let's say, um, who was happy to sling shit about Freud in a polite way, but... Uh, and exploded at him writing letters and some of the letters that Young writes as he's breaking with Freud at about the same time, 1912. Um, and he's writing letters to Freud and, and he starts yelling at him, uh, making capital letters, underlining. Uh, Young had a temper. Uh, Steiner didn't, though. He was a pretty even-tempered guy and he was very hesitant uh, to slander anyone or sling shit. But it is evident from some of his later talks given in 1903, 1923 about the formation of the Anthroposophical Society. He, in a couple of those tops, talks, he, he makes definite fun of the theosophists with some of their ridiculous ideas, like this idea that they had that there's a permanent atom, that the physical body, as it dissolves and disappears, it, it must leave behind a permanent atom that then goes into the astral world and comes back and reincarnates along with the body. All this materialistic nonsense, uh, that Steiner makes fun of in that lecture that he gave in, in 1923 about the formation of the Anthroposophical Society. Um, and in that lecture, he just keeps saying, there's just one ridiculous idea from these people after another. And uh, Jung also had made fun of the theosophists in his book, Psychological Types, uh, which was pub finally published in 1921, but it came out of his break with Freud. Uh, and in that book, he, he's talking about how ridiculous theosophists are with this idea that uh, dreams don't just happen in the in the psyche in the collective unconscious but it's the astral body that lifts out and goes into other worlds uh, so I think he would have uh, oh I know he would have included or, and did include Steiner in uh, with that group and made fun of them uh, I don't think he realized that Steiner was something quite different from the theosophical goofballs who were running the show here and Steiner just kept getting more and more agitated with them with all this political infighting that was f forming and finally, just sort of in his own polite way, just finally broke from them and said, we've been the anthroposophical movement all along, ever since 1902. 
when he wrote also Christianity as Mystical Fact in 1902. So he had been emphasizing Christianity all along. Um, and I think the more that Basant in India uh, emphasized its Eastern Oriental aspects, the more Steiner pulled the other way to emphasize its cr essentially Christian aspects. And in 1909, 10, and 11, he had written Outline of uh, Occult Science or Esoteric Science and published that in 1910 and uh, also did a, a number of lectures during that period on each of the separate Gospels, the Gospel of Mark, the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of Matthew, the John Gospel. So he'd been giving lectures on that. And so this whole blow up happened and uh, the Anthroposophical Basant finally let go of him and said, fine, go your own way. The German section can do whatever it wants. Um, we'll just be the Theosophical Society. And uh, it went its way and had its fate. And it seems like it was quite a collection of clowns and goofballs. Uh, these guys, Olcott, Ledbader, Basant. Um, I won't name Krishnamurti in there because I have great respect for Krishnamurti's later career uh, as a speaker, as a very intelligent individual. And I think he became disillusioned with them. He was just a teenager at the time. He was victimized by them. He found his own path later on, which I have great respect for. I've never heard Krishnamurti say something ridiculous ever uh, so he knew what he was doing uh, as did Steiner um, Steiner is in a completely different category from the Theosophists um, and I support Jung's making fun of the Theosophists except for Rudolf Steiner uh, whom Jung failed to identify as a genius as something uh, who is very much uh, a rival to him in terms of intellect and even further in my opinion in terms of his grasp of spiritual matters Young was good for the soul. Young understood the human soul. He understood emotions. He understood how people make projections on each other, how the sexes make projections. He was nobody understood the psyche better than Young. As far as the spirit goes, that's another matter. I think that was out of Young's ballpark. That Steiner is beyond him in his understanding of matters concerning the spiritual realm, um, which Young just did not understand. He didn't want to leave the, the safe, cozy confines of the medical world and the sciences. That was his little safety zone, his boundary. Uh, Steiner didn't have any such concerns being allied with the Theosophical movement. He could say whatever he wanted and generally did. So he gave this cycle of lectures on the fifth gospel. I think at some point he, he was he basically, this is about the time where he's writing his last books um, because he just no longer has time to write uh, since he's lecturing almost every night. Uh, and running uh, the, Theosoph uh, the German section of the Theosophical Society, which now becomes then, uh, in February of 1913, the Anthroposophical Society from henceforth. Uh, so he was just too busy to write anymore. Uh, but I think he, he wanted to write uh, this as a book, The Fifth Gospel, and but instead it exists as a series of lectures. But it's good. Um, so we'll start with this, and the, basically the first three lectures that he gives here are introductory material. So I'm going to use this one video discussion to treat these three lectures uh, as a single sort of introductory unit. And what he does basically is he goes, he starts, he says, the fifth gospel really starts with Pentecost for me. So this is the first thing that he focuses on. And Pentecost is recounted in Acts 2 in uh, the Acts of the Apostles which is actually the continuation of the Gospel of Luke. Um, and I think the Gospels are arranged in the Bible as uh, Matthew is first and then, then Luke. No, uh, let's see what the arrangement is. It, because it's different from the actual order uh, that the Gospels were written in. Uh, let's see, checking my Bible here. The, um, Matthew is first, then Mark, then Luke, then John, then the Acts. Whereas I would have put the Acts after Luke since they're meant to be the same gospel. It's just a continuation of the Acts after the death and resurrection of Christ. Um, but they put John ahead of it and split it. So anyhow, the Pentecost uh, event takes place. Uh, fifth, it's the 50th day uh, after the crucifixion, after the mystery of Golgotha, when uh, the apostles are all sort of gathered together in a house. It doesn't say where they're at. They're just in a house when all of a sudden uh, there's a, a mighty rushing of wind. Wind is always identified with the pneuma, with the masculine spirit. The spirit is masculine. And tongues of flame are descends upon the apostles and confers on each of them then a different language so that they can uh, communicate the events of what they have witnessed to all the other peoples. And the other peoples are amazed. 
people from different ethnicities who happen to be in the neighborhood and hear the apostles speaking their own home language are totally amazed. How these guys must be drunk uh, is their response. What are they? How can they speak in my language? They're all Galileans. And Peter stands up and says, "No, we're we're not drunk. Um, we have awoken, and we are going to spread the Christ event, the event of love, uh, which Steiner marks. Steiner says is a kind of what it is. It's a kind of second baptism, whereas the first baptism, the baptism of Christ by John the Baptist in the Jordan, uh, is the key moment for Steiner, where he says that is that is equivalent to a conception. That is the moment when the Christ being." And you can picture this in the various images of John the Baptist, like uh, Verrocchio's John the Baptist that Leonardo painted the folds of the angel on to the left, where Christ is standing in the river and then the dove is descending on him as John is pouring uh, the waters of baptism on him. Steiner says that's, that's the conception. The Christ being at that point came down at the age of 30 and entered into the body of Jesus of Nazareth. There are two separate beings here. And um, it wasn't a comfortable fit at first because the etheric body of this mighty sun being uh, was quite large and conferred upon Christ the ability to perform miracles at this point. So um, what we have is the conception and he says the embryo is the three years of Christ's ministry. That's the embryo. And the birth is the moment that comes with Golgotha when Christ is crucified and his blood goes down into the earth and the earth is impregnated, or uh, let's say uh, this is the moment of birth when it releases the, the all-pervasive love of the Christ being into the earth itself, which resonates. Um, and then so this sort of baptism by fire now, not by water, uh, the baptism, the symbolism of baptism is an immersion into the amniotic fluid of the mother womb. The mother womb, the great mother, in whose uh, womb one is initiated as a second birth, You've had your physical birth. Now this is your spiritual birth by descent into the amniotic fluid and reascent. That's the symbolism of the baptism by water. But now the baptism by fire that happens uh, seven weeks later after the uh, crucifixion event, and it's 10 days after ascension, um, that happens with the tongues of flame uh, is kind of a second baptism where the whole group, all 12 of the apostles, are baptized now by fire and they move into the paternal order now. Uh, to use Lacan's language, this is the name of the Father. They're moving into the order of the Big Other. They're moving from the imaginary to the symbolic order, using Lacan's language, uh, which is the order of speech. Now they have uh, the ability to speak. The Logos has descended on them and given them the ability to speak and enter into the world of the name of the Father. So it's a kind of paternal baptism now by the Holy Spirit, using the masculine elements of air and fire, Whereas the feminine elements are always earth and water. Uh, so it's a kind of second baptism. So Steiner starts with this image uh, that the fifth gospel, as he's sort of hearing it from the Akashic record, back, let's say, five or six centuries ago, it would have been an angel hovering over his shoulder, whispering into his ear. But now he uh, characterizes it as reading the Akashic record. It, this is what's coming to me as I'm speaking. So this is the fifth gospel, and he starts with this, the Acts. And he says that what happens with the Pentecost, with the descent of the Spirit, is that P uh, Peter sort of realizes that he's been asleep. He's been walking around in a kind of dreamlike slumber ever since uh, Golgotha, and uh, went into a dreamlike slumber ever since he denied uh, three times before the cock crowed twice. He denied uh, his association with Christ three times. And that signified his descent into a kind of slumber. Uh, and now with the baptism by fire, he has awakened to the realization that he was with the being that he was with was the, indeed a God, the Christ being, and that the Christ had pervaded the earth now with all prevailing love. And this wakes Peter up. And so he's no longer in uh, a dream like slumber, he's aware of his mission, he's aware of who Christ was and what he was, and now they can proceed to disseminate the word, the Logos, amongst all of the peoples. And it's a kind of reversal of the Tower of Babel. Recall that in Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel is built. Um, there's only one language in this case, and so uh, they're building the Tower of Babel, which is a Rube's parody of the building of a ziggurat, um, Babel means the gate of El, the gate of God, but it's also meant to be a pun on Babylon, 
So they're making fun of the giant ziggurat of Babylon by saying that they're storming heaven with this, which is completely ridiculous. These are uh, nomadic, uh, semi-barbaric uh, rubes uh, who are perceiving the ziggurat as, as storming the heavens. And so it's struck down and uh, they are confused. They, their different languages come into being to confuse them. Uh, so in a sense, uh, Pentecost reverses this with the proper descent of the languages amongst the apostles so that they can disseminate the gospel through the power of the Logos, the word that they become instruments of with this event, <clears throat> um, with this event. So, so this is uh, the first, second, and third lectures. And then um, Steiner has this interesting idea. He, he says sort of that what happens is um, sort of the, rever the reverse of what happens when we die. When we die, we cross over and we enter into Kama Loka and eventually Divashan. Um, but what happened with the Christ event was that the being, the Christ being, came down from the other world to this world. It's almost as though the earth becomes his heaven. It's the exact opposite of what happens. And he says it's a little bit like the Mithraic mysteries. And the Mithraic uh, mysteries were popular amongst Roman soldiers. And there was a series of seven grades of initiation for the Roman soldiers, just like moving up through military ranks where the first grade was the Korax, the grade of the neophyte, which is the raven. And then there's a second grade, I think it's the nymph, and a third grade, and so forth. And then it gets up finally to a sixth grade, which is the Heliodromos, the, the grade of the sun courier. The Heliodromos is the one who is the sun courier. The seventh grade is that of the father. Um, but the sun courier, Steiner says, this is the grade where, before the mystery of Golgotha, in order to achieve communion with the sun and the sun gods, the initiate would have had to leave his body in order to enter into the solar realm to commune with the gods. Uh, but now with the mystery of Golgotha, the reverse has happened and the sun being can come down to the earth to communicate. So he draws this sort of analogy. But the interesting thing that he says here, and I think it's very fascinating where he's got this idea with the Christ being coming down, entering into the body of Jesus of Nazareth. And later we'll see who Jesus of Nazareth was. It turns out that there are actually two different uh, Jesus boys. Uh, one of whom dies, and the other of whom, who becomes the Jesus of Nazareth, inherits his, either his etheric or astral body, I forget which. We'll, we'll get to it, though. A great deal of the fifth gospel is taken up with uh, material that is not covered in the four gospels that has to do with Christ's early life, his life as a child, and his life amongst the Essenes. Um, so Steiner sort of fills in, uh, it's, we have very sketchy knowledge of what happened with Christ's infancy and the early period before he meets John the Baptist and then undergoes his ministry for three years. And so Steiner says the interesting thing about this, uh, this Christ being that descended into Jesus of Nazareth at the moment of the baptism is that the etheric body of this being was really, um, it had to contract. It was really too large to kind of fit in the material physical body of Jesus. And so gradually over time, over the three years of his ministry, the etheric body of the Christ slowly became more and more anchored and rooted in the physical body of Jesus and became more and more identified with him. Um, and as the, and the descent of the being is what gives Christ his ability to perform miracles, to cast out demons and to perform exorcisms. Uh, the Mark gospel is the oldest of the four gospels and it's, it's I prefer it because it's more raw and it's closer to the action of uh, origin, let's say. Uh, it depicts Christ basically as an exorcist. He's constantly casting demons out of people. And as far as Steiner is concerned, this ability was conferred upon him by the Christ being who gives him this ability. But uh, the more identical this being becomes with the body of Christ, Christ begins to lose slowly his ability to perform miracles over time. Um, and I hadn't noticed this, but now that Steiner points it out, it's, it's, he's correct. Um, he's gradually becoming exhausted uh, as he goes up on the Mount of Olives uh, and his fear begins to come over him and the sweat of his brow be be begins to come a concern. So that by the time he's crucified on the cross, he's totally powerless and he's mocked by the crowd who's saying, uh, if you are a god, why can't you help yourself now? Why can't you get down from the, why can't you work miracles for yourself to get off the cross? Well, the fact is he no longer can because this etheric being has become so identified with his physical body that he can no longer perform miracles and he no longer has uh, spiritual power. So he's stuck with this physical form being nailed to the cross. Um, and all he can do is cry out, why, my father, why hast thou forsaken me? 
Uh, in other words, he's lost all of his powers. So I, I think that's a very interesting idea. Um, so this is basically Steiner's introduction uh, to the fifth gospel. And next he will begin uh, with Christ's 12th year, when he's 12 years old, and he's called in the temple to begin uh, spiritual instruction and begin giving some of his first uh, sermons. Uh, so we'll move on from there.